I ask God not to give me a, some detailed theological answer to this problem of a mountain of unbelief. How do I cast it out? How do I get this thing out of my life that hinders everything that God would do? Hinders ministry, marriage, hinders everything in life. Because you see, a prophet came to Asa after he, Syria, he got his deliverance. But the word of the Lord came to him and said, Because you did not believe, from now on, you will have wars. Everything's going to be out of order. Everything's going to go awry. awry. Everything is going to turn into flesh. You're going to get all your directions from the flesh now. Uh, I have been there. When you get out of God's will and you get out of faith and you begin to panic. First of all, it's the grief of God's heart. And secondly, you're going to turn to your own answers, your own thoughts, and your own fears are going to become a way of life. And I ask God, Lord, how do I get, how do I cast this thing out of me? Because you see, he's made it our responsibility. So you speak to the mountain and say, be gone. And it shall go. And then when this mountain is gone, then you, whatever you ask or whatever you say, everything you, you want and desire, you shall have it. And a lot of people stop right there and say, wait, 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 wait a minute. I've been there. It doesn't work. Everything I ask, well, you see, he's saying after you remove the mountain. So I ask God. And last night he really <sighs> spoke to my heart. Do you really want to walk that life? Because I'm going to have you, I'm going to show you something that's going to cost you and has no merit to it. It's the only way to get rid of the mountain. There's no other way. Oh, uh, some would say, oh, well, no, 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 you, you just have faith. It, it says, speak the word, just speak the word, mountain, go. Folks, you try that without what I'm about to tell you, and the devils will laugh at you, just as they did the disciples. When they tried to cast out a demon, a, a devil, and they laughed at him, because, you see, Jesus said this comes by prayer and fasting. No merit, but if you, if you want authority over this mountain, if you want authority over demon powers, if you want authority over those hounding fears and doubts, there's a place you have to go. And there's a prayer you have to pray when you get there. And that place is Gethsemane. This is the garden where Jesus went when his cup became so overwhelming. And his trial so crushing he goes into this garden you see people say no no this is not a generation of tears we don't cry anymore we we just celebrate well, but I celebrate Jesus Christ I love songs on celebration but you see in our modern church in this time of gold and riches and fun and pleasure and uh backslidden cold prayers we don't want to cry we, we don't want to put our face on the ground and plead we don't want to intercede but you see Jesus goes into the garden now he's never experienced unbelief that's a sin and he is, this is not a matter of his unbelief but he's got a mountain And it's the cross. And he goes in and he said, I'm, I am sorrowful unto death. 
Have you ever prayed that? Have you ever told your husband or your wife or have you t told anybody or have you f ever had a, an encounter with God? You, what you're saying, if not in words, is this is too much. It's beyond my understanding. It's, it, if this goes on, it's going to kill me. Have you ever wept tears that were so hot? It was like blood running out of your face. You know, so we don't want to touch that anymore. Because it's all... And why can't we just say, well, God's a God of love. I have preached so much love recently, and you, from this pulpit we preach grace, we preach love, but we also cannot do away with this Gethsemane experience. Jesus wept, he prayed, he interceded, he called on God, he sought the Lord. Lord, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Don't let me have to take any more of this. Now, forget trying to explain what's in the cup. But folks, if, if he is touched with things of our infirmities, it's got to be things that are in our cup. The same kind of cup. I, I don't want to get into the theological framework of this, but I, I do know this. He said, I'm in a situation, Father, I, I would plead with you and I beseech you enough, enough. And that's where you are right now. You said, God, that's enough. And you have got to believe like Jesus did that his father loved him. And his father is about to reveal something marvelous to his heart. You see, we are, there was a series of agonies that Jesus went through. Series. This is the fasting, the prayer, the weeping, the tears, the prostration. That's a series of, of spiritual episodes that are leading to a place. And then after the tears have stopped flowing, and you know the Father bottled every tear, and after the tears can no longer flow, and after all that's been said and done, Jesus prays the ultimate prayer. Now that word ultimate, one of the explanations, one of the definitions of ultimate is the end of a series. The far out end. In other words, everything has been tried the ultimate is there. And he gets up and looks God in the face. He said, in, in essence, what he's saying, I've prayed, I've wept, I've fasted, I've done everything. I've unload my soul to you, Father. But I've come to this place. Nevertheless, not my will. But your will be done. Your will be done. And until you can't move that mountain till you pray that ultimate faith and that prayer. And you can't pray that until you have unloaded everything that's in your soul to where you go to the Heavenly Father. Yes, go. It's not a, it's not a, a way of living. It's not a daily walk. But it's a confrontation where you come to the place where you say, I'm, I'm at the end. And you pour your soul out to God. And you quit looking at the circumstances and believe that God loves you and He will not allow anything in your life except that which is good, which is right, which is according to His will, according to His will and His mind. So you give up trying to figure it out and you cast yourself in the arms of the Heavenly Father and say, Lord, this, this is not what I want. I don't think I can handle much of it, but I know you're God Almighty and I cast everything into your hands and now I pray the ultimate prayer. Your will be done. 
And when you do that, God begins to you, starts opening your eyes to a revelation. You're going to, you see, a lot of people have cried and wept for God to use them and to God to give them patience and God to do something in their families and God knows what he has to do. And so God begins to allow afflictions. David said, if I had been afflicted, I would have sought the Lord. And God knows the path. He knows the cost of that. And the moment you prayed that, he went into action. And the next day, the next week, things started happening in your life. And you missed the answer. You're going around despising the answer. This is God at work. I'm going to close in just a moment, but to illustrate this, and right to the point, I remember, I thought of again last night, my youngest son, Greg, back in the pastor's office a number of years ago, he asked me to come back with him, and he threw himself on the floor and began to weep and cry and wail before God. He said, oh, Dad, I, such a burden for young people, and I don't know how to, I don't know how to reach out and get hold of this thing, but I, God has to do something as to, we're losing the generation, and I was dumb, I didn't know what to do, I just sat there and said, oh God, whatever it takes, answer his prayer. And, and so, he goes into the greatest trial of his life. Four years of incredible pain. His faith and very life being tested. But you see, I had made an ultimate prayer. I said, God, whatever it takes, because I trust you. You will only do what's right. And this past few months, God has been bringing him out in a glorious way. And he called me last week. He said, Dad, thank you for not giving up on me. And thanks for not giving up on your faith. I put everything. I never once doubted that God was at work. None of this is going to work unless you are convinced, totally convinced that God loves you. It's not going to work if you focus on your sins and won't believe. You start right there. I commit the keeping of my soul. I'm not going to spend the rest of my life trying to make things up to God. I'm not going to try to be God anymore and try to answer everybody's prayer. Hallelujah. Oh, the joy of God then when we cast ourselves into his care. Will you stand? You know, there was a time that uh, when Gwen and I would walk home from the service, I'd say, honey, how'd I do? And uh, the Lord showed me that that was a sign of a kind of hardness in my heart. I should have been asking the Lord and myself. See, I don't do that anymore, but I should have been asking, did I preach that in love? What was my point? What, what, what was I trying to accomplish? When this church was established, it took in my estimation, four years to, for God to make me even uh, a low-class kind of pastor. Because I used to see people in multitudes, and they were all faces, and I never got to talk to people, and so it was just, just faces. And then when you come face-to-face -face with people in trial and, and hardship and 
all of this. You, you, you can't just say overnight, well, I'm going to love. You have to work these things out in your own heart first. And I know that you know that you have pastors and elders here that love you. We're not into race issues in this church because every one of these men, black, white, Hispanic, whatever it is, there's something God has done by His Spirit that is supernatural. I hope what you I hope you understand what I'm trying to say that God in His love has spoken to my heart and yours. And this is what he's trying to accomplish, that you now pour your soul out to God. And I'm not going to re-preach, re-preach my sermon. You don't have to come to the altar to do that. In the annex, you can do it right where you're at. I don't want you to pray ultimate prayer here. I don't want you to just flippantly say, all right, not my will, Lord, but yours be done. But get all the other stuff out first. Tell him. Tell him like it is. Talk to him. Get alone and say, I'm not leaving this room. I'm not leaving this place. (sighs) Until my soul is at rest. And you'll know the mountain's gone when you (sighs) have this rest. I'm not trying to do it anymore on your own. We're questioning God's work, but resting on His promises and His Word. Heavenly Father, would you show us your heart? Show us where we are in our walk with you now. Are we resting on your side? Are we accusing you, Father, of child abuse? Lord, is there anything in our hearts that would hinder us now? Remove it by your grace. Take it out of our hearts. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Would you lift your hands to the Lord? Both hands. Put your Bible down, whoever it is. Just lift your hands before the Lord. And would you begin to thank him for his love for you? Just begin. That's where you start. Thank you for loving me. See, God's not mad at anybody here. He's not mad at you. Let's thank him for his love. Lord, we thank you that no matter what we're going through, you have given us evidence that you truly love us. We are under the love of God. We're under the covenant of God. We're under the grace and mercy of God. But, oh, Lord, we're also friends with God. And Lord, we can approach you as a friend and and say, I have an issue in my heart now, Lord Jesus. Give me the Holy Spirit in greater measure so that I can pray from my heart and surrender to the perfect will of God. Wherever that takes us, wherever it ends, that we will go your way in full surrender. Now, one thing before we we close the service. Up in the balcony in here, the main floor if you are not where you know you should be with Christ if you know in your heart you've grown cold or indifferent to him I want you to step out of your seat if you feel the tug and pull of the Holy Spirit I want you to get out of your seat and come and I will pray with you and we'll believe the Lord to bring you back to his heart if you have strayed any way at all, or if you've been living in dreaded fear, absolute dread fear. Now, I'm not just talking about something that happened last night, but you, it's a way of life. Now, you live day by day under a spirit of fear. I want to pray against that spirit. I want you to get out of your seat, up in the balcony, down either side, and here on the main floor, come this way. And uh, those in the annex... You can move between the screens, and I'll pray you'll be able to see and hear uh, in just a moment. While our instruments are playing, get out of your seat. I don't care if there are ten people. God wants to do something in your heart before this service is history. (laughs) 
There's only one thing you can give to God now. You can't give Him any righteousness because you and I don't have any of our own. We're saved by His righteousness. You, you can't give Him any money because He owns it all. You don't have to give Him tears. That doesn't merit anything. You don't... As, as followers of Christ, we don't merit anything by our Bible reading and by our prayer and by our tears and prostration. We don't merit anything. But there's one thing you can give Him. The one thing He wants and that you have the power and ability to give Him. And that's your faith. Your faith. Will you pray this prayer with me? Lord Jesus, forgive my unbelief. I trust You. I love you. And I do the best I can to give you my small faith. Jesus, I receive your love. I receive your forgiveness. Touch my heart. Take all the questions out of my mind. And teach me how by the Holy Spirit to trust you every single day. Not to worry, not to fear, but to rest on the promises Jesus made. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Now give him thanks.